Hi, I'm Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former Merchant Mariner, Adjunct Professor of Maritime Industry Policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, and welcome to What's Going On in the Suez, and also Los Angeles, on this, the Too Big to Fail, or is it Sail, edition. A uh, little bit of update of what's going on with two of our favorite ships that have hit the news recently. We've talked about them last week. We're going to keep talking about them because there's some interesting stories going on. Let's go ahead and share screen here. So first, uh, motor vessel Ever Given, still located in the Great Bitter Lake. She is sitting there at anchor. As we know, this week we should be hearing from a court case being filed by the UK P&I Club against the Suez Canal Authority for putting the arrest order out on Ever Given. She's being held for $916 million. So until those $916 million are paid, the ship is going to be sitting there waiting to be released. Uh, we do know that some of the crew have been let go. Uh, there was a story here that three further crew members were released off the vessel, allowed to return home. They were at the end of their contract. That means a total of five crew members out of 25 have been allowed to leave the vessel. The Suez Canal Authority has stated that as long as there's sufficient mariners on board to sail the vessel, safely operate the vessel, they're fine letting mariners come and go. I am not so sure they're going to be as, as willing to let the master, the captain, go. But we do know that they've so far allowed five of the Indian crew to head back home. Uh, I'm going to come back to this story in a minute. The other vessel we were talking about last week was this vessel. This is the motor vessel President Eisenhower. Had a couple of videos up on the website regarding this. Please take a look at them if you hadn't watched them. President Eisenhower lost power in the Santa Barbara Channel very narrowly. I mean very narrowly. Almost had an accident coming ashore on the southern coast of California. Ship had lost power due to an engine room fire. They had gotten the engine room fire extinguished, but then the vessel was adrift, heading toward the south, uh, southern California coast. Before she got close enough to anchor, because the, it's very deep in the in, in the channel right there, it doesn't really shell up until you get close to the beach. A tug out of Port Wainimi was able to get a line onto her, the, uh, the Teria Brusco, pull her back out into the channel. A larger tug, the Shirley Sea, came out of Long Beach, was able to tow her. They actually put her in a berth in Los Angeles. There actually was actually at this berth here temporarily. This morning, after the president in Cleveland, a, another vessel in the six ship program that sails from the United States to Japan, South Korea, Okinawa, and China. She was moved over here to the APL terminal and now her containers are being offloaded. That tells me that the vessel has suffered enough damage that's gonna take a while to repair so that they wanted to put the containers onto the next vessel in the APL fleet they'll be heading out. So this is a significant issue for APL. APL, which is a subsidiary of CMA, they operate US flagged vessels uh, under the maritime security program. There are nine of them, six of them are in this service. One is in, uh, does a kind of inter Persian Gulf trade and the other two operate between Japan, Korea, excuse me, Japan, Okinawa and Guam and Saipan. So this is a, obviously a big setback for them. Uh, wanted to talk about a couple of issues here. And again, the first one right off the bat is this crew change that took place on Ever Given. So I want to talk about this for a second. So five crew members have been allowed to go off. Crew change on board merchant vessels since COVID outbreak early 2020 have been a major, major issue. There was a time last year where 400,000 out of the 1.2 million mariners who were afloat were stuck on board vessels above their maximum allowed time on board. Under international maritime labor conventions, you cannot sail for more than a year on a vessel, which means the max you can be on is 11 months. And that was exceeded last year. Now, we know that 400,000 mariners were over their contracts. Their contracts usually run from four to six months, but some can run longer. And now we're seeing this issue with getting mariners off Ever Given back home. This is also telling me that the mariners were at the end of their contracts. She's been in there for a month now. So some of these mariners were obviously close to the end of their contracts. Uh, this is a major factor. Also, remember, there's a huge spike right now going on in India. And the Indian population is suffering from COVID-19 tremendously. We're, talk we're talking about thousands, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of new patients every day, which has prompted this story in G-Captain, Crew Change Crisis 2.0, Singapore bans South Asian seafarers. Singapore is a major transshipment hub. It's a hub where a lot of mariners switch out their vessels. 
And now Singapore has said they're not going to allow Indians on board or into Singapore flying in anymore. That's going to have a major impact for Indian crew. Indian crews make up a large percentage of the world's fleet. I think they're fourth in terms of nationalities behind Philippines, Pakistan. I forget with the exact order where they fall and I'll have to pull it up and look. But this is going to be a major issue right now for crew rotating crew rotation. The other story that I thought was absolutely fascinating is this story, negotiation over seafarers minimum wage increase breakdown. So you're interested in a job at sea. I'm interested in too. I want to go to far away places. I want to see places. And more importantly, I want to make a lot of money. Can I make a lot of money sailing sail? I did as a young third maid in the 1990s. When I got on board my first ship, I made a lot of money. It is lucrative pay to be a seafarer in the US merchant marine. It was great. It's not so lucrative outside the U.S. Merchant Marine, however. This is one of those issues that people who criticize the U.S. Merchant Marine will hop on. It, it's really not that lucrative. And the way it could prove it to you it's not lucrative is this right here. The minimum wage for seafarers is $641 a month. That equates to $21.07 a day. That's right. Get your job sailing the ocean seas for $21.07 a month. You work every day during the month of your contract. Again, the max you can work is 11 months. And oh, by the way, you have to work no more than 14 hours a day for seven days a week. What gets me about this story more than that, that it's, it's lousy. And I know hey, $21, that may be a lot in some countries. I understand that. Gotcha completely understand that is this element right here that they wanted to raise the salary from 641 months to 645 beginning in 2022 all the way up to 648 in january 2023 and all the way up to 660 dollars man by january 24 so yeah i mean you're talking about 19 dollars a 19 dollar wage to give mariners yearly that's not not monthly not daily not hourly yearly they're talking about giving them this month $19 a month extra to, to, to tap on here $19 a month again not a lot of money right here that we're talking about and yet the ship owning companies yeah we can't afford that I should also mention there's stories in G Captain talking about record profits record profits for everybody right now highest profits they've seen since prior to 2008 right now Maersk is making billions of dollars ONE recorded a massive uptick, over 3,000% increase in, in, in money. And so on one hand, you have the, the issue here of how much we're going to pay these mariners. We can't pay them too much because, you know, we got to make ends meet. But at the same time, record profits are being held. So be thinking about this for those mariners trapped on board vessels. We know about Ever Given, uh, but this is one of only a few vessels that really resonate. The other story I wanted to talk about is this one. This is from Business Insider. I found the story really interesting. Ever, ever given crisis puts mega ships under the spotlight. As vessels get bigger and more automated, a long serving captain and other experts are weighing up the risks. Very interesting story uh, up here. You see the, the uh, writer here is uh, Kevin, I apologize, can't read. Uh, Shalvi, he's in here talking about this. Uh, talking about what's going on, uh, talked about the risk, and he talks with Captain Rahul Kahana of al which is a, a risk management firm. And he talks about, again, the issues associated with this. And I'll have this link so you can read the story, and I always recommend you take a look at the story and read it on it. But he talks about a couple of things in here, surveying the world's riskiest shipping routes. So obviously, shipping routes are a big factor. He talks in here about the, the routes that have the most issue, and particularly they talk about the polar route, the, the route that's being touted now by Russia as an alternative to Suez, much shorter. You know, to go from Yokohama to Rotterdam, it's about 15,000 kilometers through the Suez Canal. To go via the Northeast Passage, which is north of Russia, it's only 9,000 kilometers. So definitely being uh, bandied about. Concerns about long journeys during the pandemic, again, one of the things we see is crews staying on much longer than before, not getting their rotations on board. It's a big uh, issue. Uh, and we see that going on. And in this story, too, he highlights a couple of uh, uh, links in here, uh, which I think are really interesting. And one of the links he highlights is this story right here. Bigger ships and fewer companies, two sides of the same coin. Uh, this is UNCTAD, the UN uh, uh, Committee on Trade and Development, I believe it is. And UNCTAD does the report on review of maritime transport, just a great document. But one of the things they do is, is, is do this, what's called the liner shipping connectivity 
index. Uh, the Linear Shipping Connectivity Index, it sounds very sophisticated, but basically what it does is it takes a snapshot of the container market in 2006 and compares it to today. So for example, they do a whole series of, of measures here, ship size, deployment capacity, number of ports, direct connections, weekly calls, services, and companies, and they compare it from a fixed point in, in, in first quarter 2006. That's the index. That's the 100%. And how has things increased? Well, one of the things you see that has increased since 2006 is ship size. Ship size has increased over 2.2 times, you know, over 220% roughly right there. It's increased quite a bit right there. You see it's the largest thing on the index. Uh, deployed capacity, the number of containers that are carried has increased. The number of ports has increased. So you're getting larger ships, more capacity. The number of ports have, have basically increased, just a little bit the number of ports basically has increased, but what has decreased? And I think that's really important. Direct connection. So the idea that you can load your container on one vessel and it arrives at your next your next port on the same vessel has decreased. It's it's flying an airline and having to go through a hub. You know, you want a direct flight. You don't want to have to do the layover at Atlanta or or Minneapolis or or for you know Fort Worth. You want to get the direct flight. Well, there's less containers going direct routes. Uh, weekly calls. The weekly calls are down. How often you can get your containers are going down. The services, what services are being provided is going down. And more importantly, the companies are going down. All those are measurements in this. And what this tells us is the container liner service is getting bigger. It's getting consolidated. There are less options out there for you. And this is putting power in a lot of people's hands. This article goes in some great detail. It also uh, talks about some great graphics here. This is a graphic showing where do large container ships call you know, where are those large container ships calling? And as you get here and you go through the, 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 the years here, as these spots become red, you start seeing where those larger ships are calling. And you see them right here in Asia, down in Singapore, at Sri Lanka, in Oman, uh, up here in the Mediterranean, up in, in Rotterdam, Northern Europe, off the East Coast of the United States, thanks to the Panama Canal. Oops, let me go back here, sorry. About that. Let's go back there. And off the West Coast of the United States, and it may help for me to pause it right there. There we go. And off the west coast of the United States. Same thing, you see other graphs that they use here, distribution by ports of large container ship size. So, you know, how what are the, you know, what are the ports? What's the container ship size? And as you go through time here, you start seeing the, the, the size of ships begin to increase. The big jump up there to 20,000 boxes, we see more and more 15,000 boxes, less of the smaller containers going in. And again, smaller containers are more expensive to operate because. They are, are, they just are because of economies of scale. But in some cases, you have to use small containers. You can't use big containers in certain ports. The Hawaii trade, going from the West Coast of the United States to Hawaii, you do not need a 25,000 box ship calling on Hawaii. Only a million, 1.3 million people living in Hawaii. You don't need that big. You need vessels that are tailored for that trade. And so you're always going to have these vessels, these smaller vessels, these feeder vessels. But what we're seeing is this growth here of these large maximum size vessels. Everybody thought it was, it was going to standardize around 10, 15,000 boxes. But right now we're seeing the max container ships going. How many carriers do ports have? This chart is the inverse of the large ships. You'll see dark red colored spots here right now, Northern Europe. Singapore, Japan, China, East Coast of the United States. And what you'll see is that number decrease, not increase, decrease, because we're seeing the diminish, diminishing of the number of carriers out there who is basically hauling cargo because of consolidation. Everything's being consolidated into those big nine container firms and three massive alliances. And what we see is, is where you, you see the, the blue out there is those are the feeder services. They're the ones providing unique services to areas not provided by the big companies. And then dis distribution of ports uh, by numbers of companies. Again, this is just the graphic version of that right here where you see that being done. You know, how many, you know, how many ports are serviced by companies? Uh, most companies service very small ports, but there are a few that service a large number of ports. And what you're going to see here, and I think this is going, yep, still going, is you'll see some companies all of a sudden uh, distribute to more ports. 
and and very few number of companies do that and it's it, it's just tends to be very small uh, this is a great report. I will have a link to it here. I think it's a great one to have. I also have this one here, which talks about the escalation of freight rates during COVID. So this is a graph. It's, it shows you the con Shanghai Containerized Freight Rate Index, basically how much it costs to ship a container. And it's using a series of measurements from Shanghai to South America, Shanghai to West Africa, Shanghai to the East Coast of the United States, Shanghai to the West Coast of the United States. And you'll see how the containers basically market fluctuates. They do it after 2007, eight, cause it bottomed out. It was like bottom out and you'll see it move, move, move. But the big thing here is the spike that all of a sudden takes off after COVID because again, demand increases for container ships. And what this all means is ships like the ever given ultra large container ship versus a, a medium sized container ship like the President Eisenhower. One of the things that we're gonna see is do we continue building these ultra large container ships? This is a story from 2018 in Maritime Executive. It talks about Euronav, which is a oil company, becomes world's only ULCC owner. ULCCs are ultra large crude carriers. These are the behemoth crude carriers. These are the massive ones that were developed due to the closure of the Suez Canal back in the 1967 to 75 timeframe. And one of the things that we see with ULCCs is there are not a lot of them around anymore. They are too big. They can't go into almost any ports in the world. They have to go to these offshore terminals and operate. Uh, and they're, they're just kind of out of place dinosaurs. There's not a lot of them left. The tanker industry has shifted over to VLCCs, very large crude carriers, but, but even more importantly, they're dealing with LR, LR carriers, basically long range carriers, kind of medium size. Uh, tankers versus these large, massive things. Does that happen in the cruise ship industry? Do the mega cruise ships, which are getting ready to fire back up in the United States potentially this summer, are we going to see 6,000 passengers packed on these large cruise ships or are these ships going to be too big? Are we going to go back to medium-sized cruise ships or are those large cruise ships going to have to reduce the number of capacity on board? Same thing with container liners. Are we going to see 20,000 box vessels we just saw CMA place an order for container ships. They're not ordering the big, huge, massive container ships. They're ordering 10 to 15,000 box container ships. Big issue going on in the future. All of this is resonating as a result of ever given and issues we see in shipping today. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of what's going on in the Suez and also Santa Barbara, uh, the too big to fail, too big to sail edition of the episode. If you liked it, please subscribe, give it a thumbs up. Uh, be sure to hit the bell so you're alerted about new videos. And if you can share the video, let more people know about the opportunity to learn about the maritime industry. Also, if you get an opportunity, go on over to G Captain. The new episode of G Captain Weekly with myself and Captain John Conrad is going to be hitting uh, later today on Monday. So be sure you get a chance to take a look at that episode. So I'm Sal McCoglano. Thanks for tuning in.